All right, uh, we should be live. So welcome everyone to the 10th installment of our freshly renamed webinar series, Cell Biology Scandinavia, a webinar series where we highlight uh, Nordic research and Nordic researchers. Uh, my name is Daniel. I work at Milmetech AB, uh, present in Sweden and Norway. Um, we are hosting this event together with the Baker Corporation. A uh, bit more about that to come. The title for today's event will be The Time Resolve Genomic Impact of Wind Beta Catenin Signaling. And this is a lecture that we host together with our invited lecturer, Pierre Francesco Pagella, uh, who is a senior postdoctoral researcher at the Wallenberg Center of Molecular Medicine in Linköping in Sweden. Uh, we're going to start off this event uh, with an introduction uh, uh, relating to the event itself and to Milmetech and the Baker Corporation. Uh, that will be done by me, since sadly uh, my co-host uh, uh, got a change of flight times on her flight tickets, so she couldn't be available as she is on a flight right now. Uh, but I will do my best in her absence. Uh, and then around in a few minutes, we will hand over the entire event to Pierre Francesco, who will give his uh, excited lecture that you're all here to listen to. After he's done with this lecture, uh, we will also change to a live Q&A session. Uh, in, during the live Q&A, we will turn off the recording and everyone can turn on the cameras and microphones to attend. Uh, there's also an opportunity to just write questions in the chat box. Uh, we can turn them into questions and bring them up on the front screen as well. So we're the hosts of this event, uh, Me Tech AB. Our uh, slogan is Tailored Laboratory and Industry Technologies. We're located in Sweden and Norway. Uh, and what we do, we work with technology. We supply, maintain, and install simple laboratory equipment, industrial equipment to more advanced custom projects. Uh, we're the general agent to several leading manufacturers worldwide, including Baker, our co-partner of this event. Uh, since I have your attention, I'm gonna present a uh, piece of equipment that we uh, like to promote during these events. And this is the Invivo from Baker. Uh, what I want you to ask yourselves is if a deviation from physiological conditions can affect your results. Uh, of course, then specifically physiological oxygen concentrations. Uh, the in vivo is a combination of a glove box and an incubator, uh, which gives you precision control of most importantly oxygen, but also carbon dioxide, relative humidity, temperature, and much more. So for any cell culture that uh, demands physiological oxygen, in our view, most cell culture, uh, but uh, traditionally these are used in hypoxia research, cancer and stem cell research. You can find more information about this on our website or on uh, the Baker Co. Uh, website. Some suggested reading, looking into the field of uh, wind signaling and uh, the beta catenin pathway and oxygen. There is a lot of research and a lot of data to be found. I selected a recent article this time uh, relating to the uh, uh, mesenderm differentiation uh, and how oxygen and hypoxia is related to the wind and beta catenin pathway. Uh, so. A lot of research, and of course, if you're working with this, we think physiological oxygen is relevant. Co-host then is the Baker Corporation, uh, and my co-host won't be here, so I'll do my best. Uh, their slogan is progressive scientific performance. Uh, and Baker is, uh, originally Baker was the inventor of the first biological safety cabinet in 1948. These days, Baker has grown and also assimilated Baker or the Ruskin uh, brand for hypoxia, physoxia equipment uh, and the clean air company in the, the Netherlands that uh, have been working on biological safety cabinets since the 1970s. Together then, these are a, all uh, under one uh, harmonized brand, which you can see here with their 
brand new logo type. Uh, one of the events that you're working with, in addition to what you're listening, listening to currently, is the Hypox EU. So this is a quarterly online uh, seminar series relating directly to hypoxia research, where the seminars involve multiple lectures each time uh, they take place. And this is organized together with a scientific committee featuring, among others, uh, Randall Johnson from the Karolinska Institute. If you want to read more about this uh, hypoxia research series, uh, you can find more information about that on the hypoxiu.com website. And you can also then uh, contact uh, Krista Rantanen, who is, uh, was supposed to be my co-host today, at the email shown below. Uh, I'm going to end my minutes by presenting our next event coming up in May. Uh, the title of that webinar will be how to fit in Mechani Mechani mechanics of cell integration in vivo. And uh, the lecture will be given by Associate Professor Jakub Sedzinski uh, from the University of Copenhagen. Uh, the date will be the 17th of May, and the time will be 15.30 to 16.30. We hope, of course, to see you there. Uh, that's all for my quick, short introduction. I will now hand over the, the reins to Pierre Francisco who will turn on his camera and microphone. Uh, and uh, please enjoy. Thank you very much, Daniel, for the introduction. And thank you all for joining here. Uh, so as Daniel already introduced, I'm Pier Francesco Pagella. I work at Le Chapier University in, within the group of uh, Professor Claudio Cantu. And uh, today we'll be updating you a bit about our efforts towards our actually our common goal, which is pretty broad, which is consists in understanding how cell-cell communication affects the way our genome works. And to do this, we have a favorite cell-cell communication system. Just let me know if anything goes wrong with the presentation in the meantime. So as many of you might know, I mean, wind signaling is a very conserved, uh, highly conserved cell-cell communication system. Uh, this is based, uh, I mean, what we call canonical wind signaling is based on the action of this intracellular mediator called beta-catenin. So in the absence of signaling, so when there is no, the signaling is inactive, beta-catenin is continuously degraded, degraded by a so-called description complex, which is a complex of four proteins which continuously target beta-catenin for degradation. Upon wind activation, what happens? Wind ligands are present either in the textual cellular space or they are secreted from the same cell. They interact with their receptors Fritzold and the co-receptors LIP. And as an effect, they inhibit the destruction complex. So what happens is the destruction complex is inhibited, beta-catenin is free to accumulate in the cytoplasm, and as a result, it translocates to the nucleus, where it activates uh, a set of so-called wind target genes. Now, why are we interested in this pathway? Well, the wind target, the wind signaling, and the canonical wind signaling modulates many, many cellular processes during development, during generation in adult life, and for example, homeostasis of organs like the gut. And when deregulated, it leads to cancer. So it is expressing, I mean, it's extremely interesting both for understanding how our body works, but also for therapeutic uh, purposes to understand how, beta, how wind beta catenin signaling works in detail. Now, the wind signaling ba is based on a combination, a very complex combination between 19 ligands and 15 receptors, the vast majority of which in the end all converge on one downstream effector in the nucleus, beta catenin. Now, despite many, many studies, that, I mean, many decades of study that uh, interest this field, there are many, many pressing questions still open. One of these that we find particularly interesting is actually how would wind beta catenin work uh, on a genomic level? I mean, this uh, model of uh, functioning that I just uh, briefly exposed has been very well characterized uh, for what concerns uh, specific wind target genes. However, development, regeneration, differentiation, cancer, are things that go, we think, go beyond an effect on specific target genes. 
dish mastery model the genome as a whole? So that's one of the questions we aim to address. A second big question, a second big topic often neglected is the concept of time. Indeed, uh, cells are exposed to wind stimulation, but stimulation from any pathway, to say, for a very different amount of time. So our question is, uh, being exposed to the signaling for one hour against five minutes, is it uh, one hour would just be a potentiation of the fact you see five minutes? Or would the pathway be working in a different way or eliciting radically different effects depending on how long it actually has been activated? And third axis, the tissue cell specificity. As you see, the model is pretty standardized. So there is not much space for variation between different cell types. Then the question arises, how does the same signaling pathway accept different effects in different conditions? One answer could be, of course, a cellular environment, but what if the pathway itself actually is different in different cell and tissue conditions? Now, we decided to focus our attention on beta-catenin itself. Indeed, because that's the common um, element from all the pathways, and it's the direct mediator of the transcription output of wind signal. Now, to start, since we wanted to start with our focus on beta-catenin, we wanted to reply to three very basic and fundamental questions. First of all, what are beta-catenin targets genome-wide throughout the genome? Indeed, I mean, different studies addressed uh, via ChIP-seq, for example, uh, the beta-catenin binding profile to the DNA and its interaction with other transcription factors from the transcription. We would like to provide a much higher, uh, a much more, let's say, holistic view on this point. Second point, we would like to we would like to investigate time components. So whether beta catenin binds to three genes simultaneously on a time dependent fashion, and actually, uh, are what we call at the moment wind target genes the full story, or if we analyze different time points, we might find many other or much less wind target genes. Third point, we would like to uh, to investigate whether beta catenin binds different targets in different cell types and how. Now, okay, that's not better than wind beta catenin activation model. So the first thing we had to do, we had to find a way to choose a way to activate the wind beta catenin signal pathway. So as I told you before, in the wind off conditions, the distraction complex in, in, induces the distraction, the continuous distraction of beta catenin. This as a result can't go in the nucleus and can't activate wind target genes. Now, there is a chemical called chyre, which is a direct inhibitor of one of the components of the destruction complex, GSK3. So, treating cells with this chemical results in the inhibition of the destruction complex, accumulation of beta-catenin, its translocation to the nucleus, and the activation of wind target genes. An alternative would have been to use wind uh, ligands or um, analogs of wind uh, ligands, but we decided to aim to cure First of all, because we are directly focused on beta catenin. And as you will see in the rest of the story, we are going to investigate the effect of wind activation on different cell types. We didn't want to enter possible problems related to different availability of receptors, different sensitivity to ligands between different cell types. So we went directly to the downstream effect. Now, what kind of experimental approach did we use? We want, uh, as we as I just explained, we would like to find uh, genome-wide, time-resolved, and cell-specific beta catenin physical targets in the DNA. So to do this, thanks to the great help of Anna Nordin and Gianluca Zambarini, who work in our group, we selected, first of all, two different cell types. So we selected HEC293T cells, which are in immortalized human embryonic kidney cells, known to respond to wind, wind signaling, by activated wind target genes. And human embryonic stem cells, particularly prime human embryonic stem cells, which upon wind stimulation differentiate into mesoderm. So what we did, we treated these two cell types with Kier for different amounts of time, 90 minutes, four hours, 24 hours, and three days. And then we analyzed the beta catenin binding profile at each time point in by independent biologic triplicates 
using actually a protocol we recently optimized called Cut and Run Love You, optimized mostly by Gianluca Zambanini, who's in the audience with us today. So this method actually allows us to determine the beta catenin binding profile with high sensitivity using a extremely low amount of number of cells and the much lower sequencing depth compared to ChIP-seq. So allowing us to increase the number of replicates, increase the number of uh, time points, etc. Some things will be very difficult using other techniques. So what did the manage to do? First of all, first goal uh, succeeded. We managed to produce uh, an atlas, a map of high confidence beta catenin binding events. We kept as good events, binding events, only things that we can observe at least in triplicates. And for example, as an example of how our tracks would look like, these are cut and run tracks, HEC 293, human embryonic stem cells, showing beta catenin binding. I'm showing here Axin 2, which is the favorite wind target gene from the field. And we can say that we have no beta catenin binding at time zero in wind off conditions, neither in HEC nor in embryonic stem cells. But we start seeing a binding of beta catenin both at the promoter of Axin 2 and at the characterized in answer downstream of Axin 2 already from 90 minutes and maintaining it at 4, 24 hours, and 3 days of stimulation. We see the same thing in human embryonic stem cells, but I'm already starting to spoil a bit a part of the conclusions later on. You see here this binding event of beta catenin, some kilobase upstream of Axin 2, which is actually observed only in embryonic stem cells and not in HEC cells. As a, a quality control, I mean, uh, we did an uh, emotive analysis under the peaks for beta catenin in these two data sets. And we found that actually under the motives that are mostly enriched within the beta catenin peaks are actually TCF left motives. Why that's a good sign? Well, beta catenin is not able to bind DNA by itself, it uses other transcription factors which directly do that. And the transcription factors that help beta catenin. Uh, and wind target genes actually are TCF and LEF transcription factors. So this actually is confirming us that we're actually seeing beta catenin and wind related more binding events. First observation, novel. Thing we observe with first thing you observe is that actually beta catenin targets change over time. If we look at a simple quantification of the number of beta catenin DNA binding events over time, for example, in human embryonic stem cells, we observe a huge variability. We see that already after 90 minutes of stimulation, so at extremely early time points compared to what generally people analyze, we have more than 400 reproducible beta catenin binding events in the genome. They then decrease at four hours. They then peak down at 24 hours in human stem cells, and they re-increase enormously after three days. Hex cells show less dramatic variations, but still they show changes. So we see an increase in 90 minutes, decrease at four hours, we increase at 24 hours, we decrease at three days. So hex cells have more like a rebouncing profile. To address this point in more detail, we check the, um, which, uh, to, the exact number of beta catenin binding events at different time points. And we can see that, for example, in hex cells, we identify 20 more or less. 90 minute specific binding events, 10 at 4 hours, 24, uh, 52 at 24 hours. So similar in embryonic stem cells. There is a huge amount of actually of P of uh, binding events that are actually strictly specific for a time point. So it's not only that beta catenin, for example, would bind at 90 minutes, detach, and then rebind to the same targets later on. No, the targets actually mostly change in time. Beta catenin targets are actually also mostly cell type specific. Indeed, if we take the binding events of beta catenin in HEC and the bionics themselves and we overlap them, we find that of these hundreds, only 19 are found both in HEC and the bionics stem cells. And here there is an example of one, for example, TNFRS 19, Troy. Well, for example, if you take HEC, there are these wonderful like pubic studies targets that are only HEC but not in embryonic stem cells, and the opposite. Many targets are seen only in embryonic stem cells and not in HEC. So here, I mean, just another set of combinations of peaks. 
that I actually found only specific endpoints, only specific cell types. I would like to remind you that I'm always showing only one track, but these are actually, the single track is always obtained by three independent biological replicates merged together. Now, a deeper analysis allowed us to hypothesize that actually uh, beta catenin might partner with different transcription factors at different time points compared to what we usually see. Indeed, that when we do the motive analysis in a time-resolved manner and divided by cell type, we see that, yes, both in HEC and in Bronis themselves, at all the time points analyzed from 90 minutes to three days, 90 minutes to three days, TCF left motives, the ones that are classical to mediate wind transcription outcomes, are enriched, they are found. True enough. We find, however, other kind of motives. For example, in Excel, we find CDX4, which was or recently identified with a group of Kanigan as a partner for, for Betacatina. More interesting, however, in human embryonic stem cells, we see that actually the places where Betacatina binds, apart from being enriched for TCF left motives, they are also enriched for SOX octamer motives at the early time point of the stimulation. So, showing that beta catenin binds to places that are actually potentially bound by these factors. So these are, needless to say, pluripotency factors. So they are highly expressed in the human body stem cells at the stage. However, as the cells, has actually went beta catenin is driving the cells towards mesodermal differentiation, we see a switch. We see the beta catenin binds at later time points, not only in correspondence of TCF left and rich regions, but these regions, uh, there are also regions that reach for gata factors, actually key determinants of mesodermal differentiation. Now, to investigate this further, I mean, because the presence of motive is not indication of the fact that beta catenin is really partnering with these other factors, it doesn't mean that these factors are binding there. So we checked uh, for existing uh, data sets of ChIP-seq, for example, for SOX2, and we, very, we checked to what extent uh, the beta catenin binding profile in embryonic stem cells at time zero to start and or at early time points, time zero and 90 minutes, overlaps with the binding profile of the pluripotency factors like SOX2. And as you can see here, we compare the, the binding profile of beta catenin at 90 minutes because there is no beta catenin at time zero with SOX2 in undifferentiated human embryonic stem cells. And this actual profile overlaps it by 50%. So in 50% of the beta catenin peaks, actually bind where also SOX2 is found. At four hours, the number of beta catenin peaks decreases, and it's still, but anyway, still in 43% of cases, it co-localizes with the SOX2 binding event. By three days, the beta catenin targets found at three days are actually overlap only for 4% with the targets that were bound by SOX2. And here you can see actually some examples of that. For example, a common target of SOX2 and beta catenin bound just by beta, -cate uh, by beta catenin just in 90 minutes is BMP4. There is CDX2, which is an important gene involved in dexiform pluripotency at 90 minutes and four hours, and the uh, transcription regulators marker 2. And one of the most classical green target genes, SP5, is actually bound by SOX2 in your embryonic stem cells before differentiation and by beta catenin at all the time. We did the same with GATA4, so which is a mesodermal marker. And here the results are a bit less striking, but still we see that uh, at three days, when we compare the binding profile of GATA3 in differentiated human embryonic stem cells towards mesoderm and beta catenin at three days, we see that approximately 9% of beta catenin targets are also bound by, by GATA4. Example, the classical wind target gene TNF. Arrest 519 toy, which is a nice peak of Gata 4 and a peak of beta catenin. And the wind target gene actually SP5. At this stage, there is no more SOX2, there is Gata 4, and apparently where beta catenin is bound, now there is Gata 4 bound together. So to summarize this first part, I mean our uh, deep analysis actually anal identified the two different interesting events. The fact that beta catenin physical targets are highly time and cell specific, 
and that beta catenin potentially interacts with diverse transcription factors at different time points and in different cells. Now we know the second big question, which is also pretty obvious, could be apparently obvious. Indeed, the only reason why people would care about beta catenin in the nucleus is because it modulates gene expression. Now we found high confidence reproducible beta catenin physical targets over time in the nucleus. How does it correlate with gene expression? I mean, according to the more, I mean, one would expect that every binding event of beta catenin corresponds to the activation of the gene related to the binding event. So what we did, I mean, actually, thanks to the great help by Simon Soderholm, we took all the beta catenin physical targets as identified by Caterran before, that we identified at 90 minutes, four hours, and 24 hours. And then we checked whether their binding to the DNA induced gene expression changes within 24 hours. So I'll guide through this apparently complex same, uh, slide. So we took all the binding events of beta catenin. We assigned these binding events to genes, because I mean, if, for example, if a binding event happens on a promoter, that's easy to assign, that would be the gene of saying. But more, many of the beta catenin binding events happen in intergenic regions or in putative enhancers or enhancers. So these have been assigned to a gene based on available data sets. We find that actually there are 37 common target genes between HEC and BM stem cells within these first 24 hours. There are 195 HEC specific targets and 778 MBM cells specific targets. Then we check by RNA sequencing what indeed happens to these targets. And what we were surprised to find is that, for example, if we take the common target genes in HEC cells, an equal proportion of them gets upregulated or downregulated upon beta catenin binding. Same thing is true in human embryonic stem cell. An equal proportion is upregulated or downregulated. Upregulated genes actually include the famous and very well characterized wing target genes that go into the field, like axin 2, DKK1, NKD1. Etc. So this, according to the literature, they get upregulated upon wind, beta catenin activation, beta catenin binding. We confirm this, but many others actually are downregulated. Many of them actually don't result. Actually, many binding events are not associated with transcription changes. We did the analysis in a bit of a more refined manner. So we check what happened when beta catenin was binding uh, its targets only, for example, at one time point, and then was released, what would be the effect on the gene expression at 24 hours? And we see that also here, there is not much correlation. So we see that, uh, for example, in very stem cells, uh, genes targeted by beta catenin only at 90 minutes, actually in 77 cases, they were upregulated 24 hours. In 100 cases, they were downregulated 24 hours. The proportion remains similar at the different fine points. Only those genes that have been targeted at all the time points consistently. So where we see a beta catenin peak at 90 minutes, four hours and 24 hours, show mostly an increase in gene expression. And why among these, there are wind target genes, axin 2 and SP5. Now, our analysis suggests that actually beta catenin binding can be associated both to upregulation and downregulation of physical target genes expression. Now, that's a surprise for us. This is, however, corroborated by previous observations that were not based on beta catenin binding, they were based on wind activation, same, which actually reported massive inhibition of transcription upon wind beta catenin activation, also short time points. So probably the function of wind beta catenin signaling goes much beyond the classic just wind activator, where just the classic transcription activation. For the next step, we went a bit out of the what we would consider a standard idea. Indeed, the winter field is, I mean, we as well have been focusing always on beta catenin binding, I mean, beta catenin recruitment to DNA, gene expression. However, a fundamental, I mean, element in the regulation of gene expression and the genome function is actually chromatin accessibility and to a larger extent than 3D genome structure. But we're not going to touch this point today. So, when you look in literature, there is really nearly no evidence there is 
very few papers from the past that try to investigate whether beta-catenin binding and wind activation modulates chromatin accessibility, not only wind target genes, but at the genomic level. And that's something that we would uh, expect to happen since wind beta-catenin has been shown to be sufficient to induce uh, radical changes like induced differentiation of cells. So what we did as before, we took uh, hex cells and human embryonic stem cells in wind off condition, assumingly in a chromatin state A, we treated them to Kiev with the uh, Kiev so to activate wind beta catenin signaling, and we analyzed them uh, via attack signaling, uh, via attack sequencing at different time points to verify whether the stimulation of wind would stimulate remo uh, remodeling of the chromatin. So, what we did. As I said, so it was a time resolved attack sequencing upon wind beta catenin activation in eigenvalue stem cells analyzed by the great Simon Soderholm. And we managed to obtain beautiful attack profiles. And as we can see here, for example, attack, where the attack signal is highly enriched at promoters, but also in regulatory regions. Here we see always our favorite gene, axin 2. And we see that, for example, we see its promoter region visible at the different time points in hex cells and also in human embryonic stem cells. But already here, axin 2, we go a bit upstream. Do you remember the beta catenin binding event early enough? We see that actually there are regions that are open, for example, in wind off conditions, and then they get closed at three days. And conversely, other regions, just upstream the gene, that were closed in turn zero and get open over time. Similar here. Do we have differences in another wind target gene, SP5? We see opening of the SP5 promoter in X cells. We see also increased opening of the SP5 promoter in human embryonic stem cells. This already opens a question like uh, these are wind target genes. If beta catenin is, if wind beta catenin would not modulate chromatin accessibility, then how would the wind target gene be open independent of wind? That opens many questions. As internal control also, we see octamer 4 which is a pluripotency gene which has to be switched off for good upon uh, differentiation of pluripotence themselves into more differentiated progeny. We see that indeed the octamer 4 promoter region is open in embryonic stem cells at times of 4 hours and 24 hours, but it's completely closed by 3 days. So showing that what we're seeing is actually represents physiological solutions. Now, we quantified what we just observed in a bit more, in a, quite a bit more thorough manner. So we quantified the number of uh, peaks. So peaks are like uh, uh, regions that passed, uh, that are considered open based on statistical thresholding. And we see that the number of open regions don't change dramatically in X cells with a slight increase of three days. It changes much more dramatically in human, human body stem cells. We see that indeed from zero to four hours, the number of open regions drops from approximately 100,000 to 50,000 to then bounce back around 100,000 in 24 days. If you follow each peak, actually, the situation is a bit more dynamic, even in hex cells. This is time zero. If we see at four hours, we see that actually we have approximately 10,000 regions that open and 10,000 regions that closes. And these also. At 24 hours, we see another more or less 10,000 regions that open compared to the time before and that open. Human embryonic stem cells are more dynamic. And we see actually how highly divergent they are at three days compared to what they were before. Also here we analyzed the motifs underlying the, uh, the regions that open and close. And expectedly, but actually very interesting, both in, hex, uh, in hex cells, regions that are open upon wind stimulation, actually they enrich for TCF factor. So it looks like wind beta catenin is opening regions that are responsive to itself for the next time point. The same happens also in human embryonic stem cells, although not in the very early phases. In the very early phases, the response, the regions open are more enriched for other kinds of factors, like P53, SP2, and other things. TCF comes a bit later. TCF signature comes around 24 hours and three days. We also see that later on, the activation of wind beta catenin induces the opening, I mean, induces opening of regions enriched for binding sites for June, FOS and TEA transcription factors, so other pathways, and the decrease, purple means less abundance, 
of pluipo of regions that would be susceptible to the binding to pluipotency factor, like power factors, octamen and anomen. So we also followed more in detail. I mean, we followed then for each the more each region how it behaves over time. So that we see that, of course, uh, the majority of the regions don't change the accessibility, but a good amount of them changes and it shows uh, variability over time. We then focus briefly on promoters. So promoters are the regions that are more easily assigned to actual genes. So we checked, uh, we did the gene ontology analysis on promoters that close and promoters that open over time in response to weight signaling. And in particular, interesting in the themselves, we see that actually the promoters that grow open over time, they are increasingly towards the mesodermal lineage. So you see at the 24 hours, the promoters that open are enriched uh, for geotherm like embryonic heart development and embryonic apodermophagencies. And there is a rather progressive closure of promoters upstream of genes coding for, I mean, involved in the development of other, uh, of other uh, tissues or rather, I mean, of a uh, neoectoderm in this case. So for this analysis, actually we can uh, conclude that wind beta catena activation actually induces extensive alterations in chromatin accessibility. Now, Point is, how does this chromatin accessibility change correlate with beta catenin binding? Because indeed, I mean, uh, when we activate, when we block the description complex with our treatment here, we stabilize beta catenin, but that might not, that it's known that beta catenin is not the only target. So there might be other things in addition to beta catenin that actually mediate this event. So combining the heads of Anna, Nodin, and Simon Soderholm, we integrated these uh, uh, two kinds of data sets, so our cut and run data set and delta sequencing data set. And we checked out how chromatin accessibility actually influences beta catenin binding and how beta catenin binding could influence chromatin accessibility. So I'm going to guide you quickly here. So we are, here we put one after the other the different tracks. So the first track is an attack. Wherever you see a blue box, it's an attack sequencing track. Where you see no blue box, it's a cut and run box uh, track. So here we have some examples. So we see that uh, in Hexels, for example, in this region, in the middle of the DSG4 gene, we see that there is no access, the chromatin is not accessible in wind of conditions, and there is no beta catenin inbound. However, after already 90 minutes of stimulation, we see a significant enrichment, so a significant beta catenin recruitment to the DNA there, which is followed by chromatin opening, by attack sequencing at four hours. And then both beta catenin, beta catenin is found there throughout the simulation time, and the chromatin is open throughout the simulation time. This is the case in many other regions. An interesting region, for example, is this other one. It's a positive regulatory region in an intergenic location. We see that also in this case, the genome is not accessible at wind off conditions. Beta catenin binds this region in 90 minutes, the region becomes open at four hours. At 24 hours, beta catenin disappears, and so does the attack 6 signal. So these data are correlative, but they show that in several instances, it's above 30, let's say, per cell type, beta catenin binding actually is followed by changes in chromatin accessibility. These are some examples selected. We did the analysis on the genome scale. So here, I will show you some alluvial plots that represent how chromatin accessibility might be influencing beta catenin binding. So these are, for example, in uh, embryonic stem cells. These are all, we took all beta catenin binding events and we checked what was the chromatin state, all the beta catenin binding events uh, from zero to three days. And we checked what was the chromatin accessibility status of these regions at time zero. So more or less 50-50. 50% of them were non-accessible, 50% of them were accessible. At 90 minutes, we see that actually a similar proportion of them, okay, let's say a good proportion of them actually, were actually bound by beta catenin despite them being non-accessible according to attack sequencing data. 
And this kind of pattern can be found at the many different time points. So we found many cases in which beta catenin binds to apparently non-accessible chromatin. Conversely, here we highlighted these instances where the binding of beta catenin was followed by a changing account accessibility. For example, in this event here, in Excels, at four hours here, this region was non-accessible and non-bound by beta catenin. But within the within 24 hours, it became accessible and bound by beta catenin. So this uh, this kind of analysis uh, allows us to suggest that uh, beta catenin might potentially bind to non-accessible chromatin regions, at least non-accessible for what uh, attack sequencing tells us. And that beta catenin recruitment can be followed by alterations in chromatin accessibility. Now, we wanted to focus uh, a bit more on what we call win target genes, because this is genome wide. We want to check what happens at genes that are known to be targeted by beta catenin, and that beta catenin induces gene uh, over expression there. So, we took these four genes to start axin 2, BKK1, IRET1, and LEF1, one of the win target genes. And uh, uh, Simon, we quantified the common accessibility. So, in this case, we didn't. Uh, do simply peak or no peak, binding or binding, but he quantified how much attack signals, attack signal we find at these promoter regions. So, and actually, this is hex cells as usual, this is embryonic stem cells. We were surprised to find the peculiar behavior. If we take, for example, the in 2 promoter, we see that the chromatin accessibility, as indicated by the count of attack rates at the promoter, at in 2 promoter, increases from zero to four hours to then decrease the 24 hours and three days. Conversely, in human embryonic stem cells, the accessibility at the wind target gene increases progressively over time from zero to three hours. This behavior is actually conserved. This trend is observed in all the wind target gene, in all the four wind target genes analyzed. And actually, much more than that. We expanded this analysis at this point to a set of 20 bona fide wind target genes. And we found that indeed, all of them show the same behavior in human embryonic stem cells. So they all increase the chromatin accessibility over time, showing what we call a chromatin elastic response to wind activation. On the other side, also all the wind target genes we analyzed in hex cells show the behavior we've seen before. So they increase the accessibility within four hours. But then at 24 hours, they already come back at the levels of observed time zero to further decrease at three days. So we call this response an elastic response. As a control, I will not show here, actually we identified several genes that are not wind target genes, which actually change the accessibility in the opposite term. So they decrease the accessibility at four hours. Now, interesting, but okay, we, we blocked the destruction complex, we induced wind, now, we ask, is beta catenin itself needed to modulate chromatin accessibility? I mean, it's not known that beta catenin would modulate chromatin accessibility. So we first reconfirm our data using attack PCR. So we've seen that also in another set of six experiments, we can actually observe the opening and the closing of the promoter, for example, vaccine two upon wind activation. When we do, however, the same thing in beta catenin knockout hex cells, we don't see anything. So the chromatin doesn't open at the promoter of vaccine 2, nor of the one of DKQ1 and other target genes analyzed. We try to partially rescue this phenotype by overexpressing a, a constitutively active form of beta catenin, a form that is in response to a description of to the decision complex. And indeed, we could rescue, at least in part, the opening of the chromatin. We observed that overexpression of beta catenin in itself. Is a, allows to double up the accessibility at axin to promoter. So this suggests that uh, if not sufficient, beta catenin is actually necessary to elicit this wind dependent chromatin opening. Now, the last question that we try to assess is whether how beta catenin could do that. Indeed, beta catenin doesn't have chromatin remodeling domains, so it can't do it by itself. Our educated guess was actually that beta catenin. I mean, we know that beta catenin is known to recruit CBPP300, which is an histone acetyltransferase, 
to the um, promoters of wind target genes. So we investigated whether inhibiting CBP3300 would phenocopy beta catenin loss. And the answer is yes. If we treat uh, wild type cells, hex cells, with KIR, but in the presence of a CBP300 inhibitor, actually we don't have any opening of the promoter. Funnily enough, however, the same thing happens also when we do the opposite. So we inhibit an histone deacety uh, deacetylase. Also, we prevent the opening of the tonic. So these results actually allow us to, say, to conclude that actually the activation of wind beta catenin signaling modulates actually common accessibility of wind target gene promoters. In embryonic stem cells, they show plastic response, reminiscent of the overall plastic behavior and the acquisition of the different identity. While in hex cells, they show an elastic response, so they rebound back, which seems to be similar to what they do as a cell on a whole, the cells. So they don't change identity when wind is stimulated. So I suggest that this might be, I mean, this prompt us actually to investigate in the next future, whether these two responses are indicative of general responses of developmental versus homeostatic wind signaling. Also, beta catenin in itself is required for the increase in the ectomatin accessibility we observe, and probably with the help of CBP300 and HDAX. I would like now to close the last uh, five, ten, five, eight minutes of the of this presentation with another kind of question. We started indeed wondering whether whatever we are always analyzing all these analyses are done on bulk populations. So, so we give here plate analyze. But we're wondering whether what we are seeing is actually a real description of what is happening within every cell. Indeed, when we give wind, we activate here and we measure bulk. But this could be this bulk measured expression, for example, of RNA accessibility, etc., could be due either because all the cells show a homogeneous response, as actually the model would posit at the moment. Or actually, it could be an average between different heterogeneous single cell specific responses. This was also prompted by the observation in our Caterham datasets of many binding events which would fall just below the statistical threshold that we chose for pick calling, for calling it a real binding event. For example, this CRAD, CRAD gene bound by beta catenin at 90 minutes reproducible in triplicate. But then not bound anywhere else. But then when you look at four hours, this time point here, this peak is a bit big, smaller than that one. Is it mm, just noise? Or did it fall below the the, mm, the threshold just because it's a real beta catenin binding event, let's say in 20% of the cells, while in 90, at 90 minutes it was happening in 80% of the cells? So to start addressing this question together with Simon Soderholm and Amaya Joregi Miguel, we decided to do a simple experiment, powerful. So we analyzed the single cell response of human embryonic stem cells to wind beta catenin signaling activation. So we took human embryonic stem cells, we used six independent biological replicates, and we treated them with Kia for four hours, 24 hours, and 72 hours. And then we analyzed by single cell RNA sequencing. So, it's a single cell RNA sequencing, so the UMAP doesn't tell much. We see that over time, this dot in these dot plots, the size of the circle is always representative of the number of cells, the proportion of cells that expresses the gene, and the color, how much. It's so the level of expression. So we see that over time, from zero to three days, the expression of pluripotency factors decreases, goes from blue to red, and the expression of winter target genes actually increases. So the dot plot suggests that. Now, what we did, we analyzed the correlation between wind target genes expression in human embryonic stem cells. So we assessed the expression level of each wind target gene in each single cell and check what was the correlation level using Spearman correlation. So as you can see, the dark color is the super high correlation of each gene with itself, as you control. White color means no correlation. Red color means inverse correlation. Now, while some genes show a bluish kind of color, meaning that there is a somehow 
there is correlation, you see that in much of this plate, the color is white. So this shows that the correlation is not really high. Correlation gets a bit higher for some target genes at 24 hours and for some other genes at three days. So also the fact that this pattern is not constant shows us that there is something a bit more than all target genes expressed simultaneously in all the cells. We focused our attention at this point. We took one of the genes that showed apparently correlation in this plot. And we did this kind of representation. So we ranked all cells based by axin to expression. So here we have, and on uh, so on the x-axis, it's just cells ordered, nothing else. On the y-axis, there is gene expression. So in black, it's axin two expression. In blue, it's NKD1 expression, for example. Here we see a nice correlation. At time zero, there is very little expression of both of them. At four hours of stimulation, we see that there is an increase in the axin two expression as marked by the black line. And the blue dots, each of them is one cell and its expression of NKD1 follows. Similar at 24 hours, similar at three days. So dynamic is similar. NKD1 apparently gets upregulated more than axin 2, but these are cattle. Something is, when we take, however, a gene that, seen, uh, that was defined as uncoupled, we found a very different scenario. So axin 2 increases, but we already see that at four hours, we can find in cells that express very little axin 2, as the ones down here, high expression of SP5. And conversely, where we see high axin 2 expression, we find many, many cells, which are SP5 low. This kind of uncoupling is also temporal. So the, the number one is more easily explainable. But so they both increase at 24 hours, but by three days, then axin 2 increases further, while SP5 decreases compared to 24 hours. Now we analyzed, we focused our attention on these two cell populations. The axin to high SP5 low at four hours and the SP5 high axin to low at four hours. We chose four hours because this, uh, because we wanted to check the earliest time point to minimize the potential uh, secondary effects. You know, we activate a very complex transcriptional program. So the uncoupling of the wind target genes might be due to differential feedback mechanisms. Still not really investigated. So that would also be quite a novelty. But at four hours, we assume that the time to establish complex feedback mechanisms would be at least short. We took these two cell populations and we compared their gene expression. And we found that indeed they have significant changes in gene expression. So I find that actually a key difference between these two cell types is actually in the cell cycle state. We cannot know whether the cell cycle was actually causative of the difference of the expression of these target genes or the other way around, but we find both scenarios actually equally interesting and fascinating. We further correlated actually the beta catenin binding we observed by beta catenin cateran, and that should express the, the, their expression in single cell RNA sequencing. And we find that actually there is a good correlation, for example, this axin 2 and SP5 are targeted early and throughout time, and we see that actually they are progressively upregulated. And late targets are actually indeed mostly upregulated at later time points. However, as we said before, our cut and run data show that both axin 2 and SP5 are bound at the bottom population at all the time points analyzed. But if we check at a single cell level, axin 2 and SP5 are indeed actually not expressed always in the same cells. So our catenary data are indeed sampling the population. In fact, we're not really being able to see what is happening within each nucleus. Last, uh, we further investigated whether this is true also in more, uh, in other kind of scenarios, for example, in vivo, and we took uh, a publicly available human colorectal cancer data sets for example, this data set from Hulix et al. published in 2021. So it is a colorectal cancer data set in which they compare the single cell profile, RNA sequencing profiles of healthy versus tumor tissues, always from the gut. We selected the human, the, only the epithelium, both of healthy tissues and cancer, and focused on the LGF5 polycells 
which are the ones that are supposed to have the most striking uh, and the, the strongest activity of wind signaling. We found, first of all, that, I mean, the amount of axin-2 expressing cells within the LGFR positive cells in the single cell data set is not super high. But also here, the expression of axin-2 is not really coupled with the one, for example, of sp5. The same target gene we found before is uncoupled in human embryonic stem cells. And in general, the correlation between wind target gene expression in healthy LGFR positive cells is not super high. So suggesting the most probably the wind target genes are very often not expressed together upon wind stimulation. In the LGFR positive cells of tumor epithelium, however, this correlation increases a bit. So suggesting that when in these tumors, tumors that are driven by wind overactivation, wind target genes are more expressed at the same time. However, when we look, when we distribute the cells again by axing to expression, we find also here population where you have a very high sp5 expression and in this case no axing to expression and cells that show the opposite behavior so where axing 2 is very high and sp5 is very low we further confirmed i mean we didn't uh, but i'm not going to show it here but we observed a similar behavior in other two kind of data sets a data set of hexons generated by us and published available uh, in developmental data sets in particular um, in the developing four link. So to conclude, the whole talk actually, <laughs> I would like to key, give you the key messages. So we show that actually wind beta catenin targets are time and cell specific. Most of them are with really time and cell specific. Wind beta catenin activation can induce extensive alterations of chromatin accessibility, and beta catenin potentially binds to non accessible chromatin regions and is involved in the modulation of chromatin accessibility. Wind target promoters also show different chromatin responses in different cells that might be actually a chromatin response that might be indicative of an underlying tendency to either respond in a plastic way or in a repulsive way to the stimuli wind gives them. And then also that wind target genes are not activated homogeneously by wind petrocadine at the single cell level. So rather the situation is much more heterogeneous than what currently postulated by the model. So with this, I finished. So most of the results that I explained, that I exposed here, are present in the three manuscripts that I cite here. So our two preprints, time resolve analysis of wind signaling, uh, and uh, the single cell response to wind activation is another bioarchive preprint. They're both in review currently. And then the protocol that allows actually the profiling, the time resolve profiling of petacatinin is actually available also and has been published in development at the end of last year. With this, I conclude. I would like to thank uh, the group, Claudio Cantu, Anna Nordin, Sino Holman, Gianluca Zambanini, and Amaya for the great help for all this work, all the group for the support, and our funding agencies, uh, you for your attention, and Daniel Entity for providing me the possibility to present my data. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, and thank you, Pierre Francesco, for that uh, very fascinating talk. <clears throat> uh, what I'm going to do now is that I'm going to turn off the recording and change the entire setup into a meeting. We will provide the uh, audience uh, an opportunity to directly ask Pierre Francesco some questions. So hold on. <clears throat>